you're all very welcome to the Children in Northern Ireland's Right to Food webinar. And before we get started, given that we're using this digital technology to try and run what we normally run as a conference, uh, I'm going to sort of set out, first of all, some technical aspects. There is a, an opportunity for you to ask questions as a chat function. And if you send in your questions on chat, we'll try to address, the uh, try to answer them questions. However, if we don't get a chance to answer them, we'll email the answers out to you as we send out the link to the webinar. So on to the webinar. We know that food poverty is a major social issue, uh, both for children, young people and for parents. And it impacts children and young people regard to the lack of free school meals in out of school time. And parents and low incomes, uh, children and young people, and parents are continually looking for means and resources to actually feed the young people during the summertime. And that's critically important because what you find then is parents going without food themselves or cutting back on other necessities within the home to actually make sure that the children get fed during the summer period. And this has probably come into a sharper focus because of COVID-19. So. The purpose of the webinar today is for me to look at, first of all, what does international law say about it? What does the United Nations uh, Conventions on the Child say about it? What, does, uh, what is the research currently highlighting in regards to food poverty? So we want to explore some of these issues today in the webinar within an hour. So first of all is we hope that the webinar itself will shine some light on food poverty and the solutions that we hope to look to develop a strategy to deal with food poverty. So, first of all, on to the webinar, and I invite, first of all, uh, Catherine Kelly, MLA. She's the Deputy Chair of the All-Party Group on Children and Young People to address us. Thank you, Liam, and good morning, everyone. Uh, childhood hunger is a reality here in the North. I have witnessed it at first hand recently being part of my local community response to COVID-19. Our local community food banks in Oma have been inundated with many families who in some cases had to rely on support for the very first time. But as we know, this is not something peculiar to this pandemic. During the summer holiday period, up to 100,000 children are missing out on their free school meal. That is almost one in four school children. For some children, this may be the only substantive meal they will eat in a Years of relentless Tory austerity has made its mark. Families already struggling financially are hit over the summer period because of the additional costs for extra food. The links between educational underachievement and deprivation are well known, and the evidence suggests that children returning to school can often be weeks or months intellectually behind classmates who have access to a more wholesome diet during the holidays. The onset of COVID-19 public health emergency provides a unique opportunity for us to do things differently. Direct payments have been made regularly to the families of over 100,000 children. We have seen thousands of food parcels and checks provided for those harder to reach families. The Education Authority Youth Service has also launched a programme, Eat Well, Live Well, a safety net for the provision of free school meals to children and young people during COVID-19 which is, as you probably know, anyone aged four to 25 years could apply to access a five-day food box providing breakfast and lunch Monday to Friday. Demand for this programme has been exceptionally high. It has now reached its approved capacity and new registrations have had to be suspended. This once again demonstrates the level of childhood hunger. We have called for additional capacity to meet the clear demand and also for the extension of this over the summer period. We have the mechanisms and the means to address holiday hunger this year. Sinn Féin has heavily lobbied the Department of Education to work with Communities Minister Deirdre Hargate's initiatives beyond the end of June. We've made Minister Weir aware of the urgency of this issue and I understand costings have been drawn up and this has been discussed at executive level. I have met with and urged the relevant officials in the Executive Office and other departments to make additional funding available to the various community groups involved in these projects and delivering these supports. Indeed, currently I am working with my local community association, an area of high deprivation, to establish an initiative to assist efforts in tackling holiday hunger. Sinn Féin will deliver for these children and we will work to ensure that no child goes hungry. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Catherine, and well within time. Uh, so our next speaker is actually Dr. Sinead Fury from the University of Ulster, who has done research on food poverty and health inequalities in Northern Ireland. So I invite Sinead now to speak. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to join you all this morning for this important webinar. Um, I'll just give a little bit of um, context and then focus on some research, both um, at the United Kingdom, but also importantly, at the Northern Ireland level. So um, food poverty, um, by way of a definition, it's the inability to consume an adequate quality or indeed quantity of food and importantly to be able to do so in socially acceptable ways. And looking to the bottom of the screen you can see there are different uh, levels of severity in terms of food insecurity, food poverty. So it ranges all the way from worry or anxiety that you may be unable to afford your next meal right through to actively missing or skipping a meal. And this exists in the and in the United Kingdom, uh, fifth richest country in the world, 21st century, this hidden hunger exists right on our doorstep. And it has all the signs of a public health emergency. And it's a public health um, emergency because actually food insecurity, food poverty has overtaken healthy eating as the most pressing public health concern. And some people rightly say, well, what is the point in trying to get people to eat healthily if indeed they're not eating at all? So it's a very real situation and of course um, the current situation has um, has shown um, a deeper light on it as well. So the next slide. So and again in terms of context specifically for Northern Ireland almost one in five of us, 19% of us, are living in relative poverty before housing costs. That's generally speaking and if we look specifically to the food poverty agenda the most recent data um, for Northern Ireland um, is the Northern Ireland Health Survey um, for 2017-2018. That was the last time that food security um, was included as a question in the survey and 3% of us hadn't eaten a substantial meal at least one day in the past fortnight due to a lack of money. Now that's it at the general at the average level. If we look to the poorest 20% of the Northern Ireland population that figure actually doubles and 6% of us um, um, had missed at least one meal in the last fortnight. And again, if we look at it from another um, measure, low-income households spend disproportionately more affording food and non-alcoholic drinks than the UK average. So again, using 2017-2018 data, um, uh, the poorest um, people in uh, the UK were spending half as much again affording food just over 15% of their household income being spent to afford food and drink compared to the national average of just over 10.5%. Next slide, please. So there has been huge um, research effort um, right across the island of Ireland, uh, right across the United Kingdom. This just presents some data, some um, research effort that is particular to Northern Ireland, ranging from a very important cost of healthy food basket that was um, co-produced by the um, CF Food, Food Standards Agency in Northern Ireland and the Consumer Council. Um, and that we're going to rely on some of those data later. Um, there was really a, a seminal study in 2006-2007 which was the food poverty fact or fiction piece of work and that really recommended that let's do what we say we are going to do. Um, we have already made published commitments um, to address food insecurity so it's not even that we really need a new policy, let's just make sure that we do what we have committed to do that's in the public domain. And to present also later in the slides um, some Northern Ireland research that Ulster University has undertaken. Next slide please. So specific to um, Northern Ireland, Ulster University, um, we conducted some research of 944 people. It was an online survey that was supplemented with some hard copy um, paper surveys just to make sure that the most vulnerable people their voices could be heard. And we undertook that field work between September and November 2018. And the headline finding for Northern Ireland households is that between one in five and one in three, so somewhere between 20 and 35% of Northern Ireland households reported experiencing at least one symptom of food poverty, as I say, right throughout the spectrum, with respect to either worrying that they may run out of food, right through to not eating enough. Now there is some good news because previously there, there hadn't been an agreed indicator by which to understand the extent of the problem in Northern Ireland in the UK. Um, but happily from April 2019 the UK government has agreed to measure 
uh, food insecurity, food poverty through the Family Resources Survey. So the first results will be available from April 2021. So uh, really what Ulster has done has provided some large scale research in the absence of um, a sufficient sample um, really um, for Northern Ireland. So all too often the answer really has been to food insecurity, to food poverty, that we would um, address the problem through food banks. And the number um, of food banks has been increasing throughout Northern Ireland to the extent that we now have 38 food bank centres across the region. And they have they've issued the highest number of parcels in 2018-2019, um, that's the most um, recently available data that I have, and that's the highest number ever on record since 2012-2013. Importantly, from children in Northern Ireland and the point of this uh, webinar and its focus, more than one in three of those recipients of food parcels was it for a child. And to that total of 38 food bank centres, we also must remember there are independent food banks, so it's actually difficult to understand how many food banks there are in Northern Ireland. Important too to remember that about eight out of every 10 people living in, for, in food poverty actually don't choose to go to a food bank, perhaps because of stigma, because, perhaps because of lack of access. So it is a very underestimated problem um, if we rely on food banks and emergency food parcels as the indicator for food bank uh, addressing food poverty. And really they are not a sustainable solution. We need something more sustainable something more enduring because food banks are a sticking plaster on the gaping wound of food poverty. Next slide please Roger. So a typical food bank parcel um, looks like as displayed on the screen. What we've done in Ulster is we have costed how much that is at retail prices and we have extrapolated that three days to a seven day a week um, uh, food parcel. Um, the price of that would be £17.66 using 2017-2018 prices. The Safe Food Study, um, in conjunction with Food Standards Agency and the Consumer Council, found that um, for an acceptable nutritionally adequate diet, it would cost £57.05 to feed one person for a week, a nutritionally adequate diet. And again, using 2017 data, the average UK household is spending approximately that, £56.80, affording food. If you look at one week food parcel compared to the national average or the nutritionally adequate diet, we are talking about two very different dietary experiences um, with a 3.2 times cost difference um, between the both ends of the spectrum. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go into huge detail here except to say that the charitable sector, food banks, uh, um, have stepped in to the mix here and they are contributing the equivalent of between 60 and 75 million pounds in direct food aid. That's equivalent to about 0.4% of the entire allocation to social welfare. So the point really of this slide is to say it's the same people who are overweight, it's the same people who are um, going hungry. The health inequality is obvious, but we ask the question, Given that it's approximately 0.4% of the allocation to social welfare to help people in this dire um, situation, can we afford not to do this? And remember, if we go back to the, the opening point, everyone has the right to a standard of living. Everyone has the human right to food. Can we afford not to do this? Next slide, please. I want to take just a little second to bring us bang up to date with respect to food insecurity at the time of this, um, during this pandemic. So I'm quoting um, a small scale research um, that was included in uh, Food Foundation, St Guy's and St Thomas's, Church Action Poverty and King's College. They conducted um, research pretty quickly after um, lockdown started. So this, um, these data refer to the 24th to the 29th of April um, to 2,000 plus um, households across the UK. Important to note, we had 78 households um, in Northern Ireland as a pro rata sample. So the first three bullet points talk about the UK situation. The fact that 5 million people in UK households with children have experienced food insecurity since lockdown. Uh, thank you. Um, and if we look to Northern Ireland, that, but there is 13% of Northern Ireland during this pandemic who have reported um, food insecurity symptoms. That's four times the 2018 figure that we talked about in the Northern Ireland Health Survey. And the last slide, please. 
So by way of conclusion, what I'm saying is that the, the research would indicate that we, uh, we need a long-term sustainable solution for food poverty. And the single best way to do that is to arrive with policy solutions, policy-based solutions, structural solutions that address the real issues underlying here. Low income, under or unemployment, rising food prices, indeed rising cost of living generally, and of course welfare reform. And it isn't enough to continue to describe the problem, we must also take um, parallel action so that we can invest in this future health of our most vulnerable citizens experiencing hidden hunger on our doorsteps. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sinead. That was terrific. And really, it gives us a lot of research, actually, when we start to look at the whole policy development going forward. And it'll be critical that research, we continue to build on that research. So I want to move on to the next speaker, which is Les Allenby, who's the Chief Commissioner for the Northern Ireland Rights Commission. <laughs> we all know that the, uh, the rights of the child are enshrined within the United Nations Convention. So, and Les, I invite you to address us again, please. Thank you. Liam, thank, thank you. Um, and I'm delighted to be here this morning. Um, the right to food is a human right. Um, Article 25 of the UN Declaration on Human Rights, it makes it part of the right to an adequate standard of living. It includes food, housing, medical care. It's worth saying that that's now over 70 years old, and this issue remains as important today as it was um, in another um, era. We have both economic and social rights as well as civil and political rights. Um, they're inextricably linked in my view. So again, um, the right to an adequate standard of living and food and clothing and housing is in the International Covenant of Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. And the reason that civil and political and economic and social rights are interlinked because essentially if you want to participate in society, you have to have enough money to afford a bus fare, to turn up at a public meeting or a demonstration, or to put a stamp on something to send your views to a public body or have access to a computer, etc. So economic, social, political, cultural rights are, are inextricably linked. Uh, for children and young people, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, signed up to by every country in the world bar one, the United States, to do with um, some states' um, ability and desire to um, inflict capital punishment on, <clears throat> on young people. Children and young people should be able to live in a way that helps them reach their full physical, mental, spiritual, moral, and social potential. The convention recognizes that parents should be given the tools to do the job, to bring up children effectively. Um, Article 6 says, that um, children and young people should be able to survive <clears throat> and develop. And these rights are important because no one in Northern Ireland needs to go without food or live in poverty. And they wouldn't if we distributed resources uh, more fairly and equitably. Um, the new UN has a, a network of experts called Special Rapporteurs. Philip Alston last year, who recently stepped down as the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, uh, looked at the social security system across the UK and found that it exacerbated poverty and inequality when it could be used to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality. <clears throat> he and his predecessors have also written about tax as a human right, the idea that we can redistribute resources through progressive tax systems, through making sure corporations pay all their taxes. <clears throat> and that's for us at the Commission, an important dimension to, to all of this. Why is it important? Well, uh, if you don't have enough food, then we know that it also means you don't have enough fuel in your house, you go cold in winter, you will have poorer health, you will often live in insecure and overcrowded uh, and poor housing conditions. And in effect, what we're asking um, many of our young people is to run a race where they start in the outside lane and are told to remain in the outside lane and at the same time we're tying the shoelaces together of both feet um, as well. What's the extent of this in terms of numbers? Last month the Department for Communities published in the Northern Ireland Poverty Bulletin for 2018-2019. One in five adults 
and that's 350,000 adults, and one in four children, that's 107,000 children, live in relative poverty, one in six adults and one in five children uh, live in absolute poverty. And for children, that's 92,000 people. And all of those figures have got worse since the previous year. So we're heading in the wrong direction. The executive, Northern Ireland executive and the assembly <clears throat> cannot transform equality on their own, but they can make a significant difference. Um, and we need a conversation about inequality and redistribution. Um, to give you some examples of how we can do things, Northern Ireland has control of social security. It's a devolved matter. Um, we know that the executive fought valiantly against the changes, um, the austerity kind of cuts to social security from 2010 onwards. Um, and uh, eventually instituted uh, a set of mitigations package which was renewed on the 31st of March uh, for a further two months. It's just been renewed again for a short period, but there is a need to, and there's a commitment to review and revise that package. The Commission itself undertook a cumulative impact assessment on all the tax and social security policies implemented uh, by the UK government and eventually forced on Northern Ireland. Um, and what it showed was that those who can least afford to bear the burden have shouldered the, the most. If you remember the rhetoric, we're all in it together. Well, actually those closer to the top of the inco household incomes have done uh, far better from the changes than those towards the bottom. Um, <clears throat> the commission has put together a, <clears throat> a, a set of, uh, uh, a, a package for for mitigations it's around 200 million a year it's been costed and it's been tested in terms of what does it mean in progressive redistribution it involves things like ending the two child policy continuing to uh, not implement the benefit cap and the bedroom tax additional money for carers additional money for uh, newborn children in the social security system for <clears throat> extra money for people with disabilities etc um, one of the things it also includes is the cost of work allowance that was never implemented before and it argues that that money um, which still because of the treasury and, and rules can't be implemented should be transferred into dealing with food poverty and any underspend in the package of mitigations which is what happened last time should be ring fenced as well for food poverty. So what can we do in terms of um, beyond that? First issue for me is we don't have an anti-poverty strategy. The High Court found that that was unlawful in June 2015 in a case taken by the Committee for the Administration of Justice. Five years later, we still don't have an anti-poverty strategy. Second, we can do something about uh, school meals. Free school meals is a very progressive way of, of managing um, issues. The DFC and Department of Education have run a number of very valuable initiatives, including providing £2.70 per child per day for around 55,000 families and benefiting around 100,000 children. That's an initiative that needs to be continued over the summer and embedded in the longer term. Um, <clears throat> and there's a longer term debate that we need to have about coming out of the other side of the pandemic. And one of the, those um, discussions is why we condemn over a third of a million adults and over a hundred thousand children to poverty every year when it doesn't need to happen and these are rights issues that go right to the heart of what kind of a society we are and that we should be and that's the debate that I hope that we'll have as we come out of the pandemic uh, and in the short term we need to look at both mitigations food poverty initiatives and other things that we can do while we look at a much longer term set of solutions, but there is about redistribution. So delighted to be here um, and thanks Liam. Thanks very much Les. Uh, uh, again, 
highlights some of the some of the critical issues that's really faced in Northern Ireland. So I want to move on then, really, to look at the position from a young person's perspective. So we're going to have next uh, the young food ambassador, uh, Shane Robinson, who's going to talk about food issues facing young people in lockdown. So Shane, on you go. Yes, uh, thank you, Liam. I just met it back in on time. My Zoom's just after crashing there. All right. <laughs> I am a food ambassador for the Food Foundation, and I've been working with Oasis Youth for a number of years now. So just to keep my speaking time short and sweet, I just wanted to talk about some of the concerns that we're having when it comes to food poverty over lockdown. Um, and this will mainly just detail some of the um, some of the struggles that families and young people are having to go through and what we're doing to combat that. So one of the main struggles that I think many people are facing and one of our main concerns is the so the government is obviously continuing to uh, provide money to, for children who are eligible for free school meals at this time uh, but we are concerned about where that money is exactly going there's no way for us to really track that and with a lot of parents being uh, off work due to furlough or just losing their jobs completely due to COVID that money could well be going to things like heating, like rent, like electricity, and to other bills, which obviously means that it's not always going to the young people, that they're not always getting the money that they need for the food. Um, one way that we are trying to combat this within Oasis is by sending out food directly to the young people rather than money. Uh, so this is being done through food parcels, uh, through winning competitions. So one example that we're sending out is uh, for competition winners, like lunch packages, which they make themselves, which um, they can sit down as a family and cook and eat together. Um, and so this has included stuff like uh, pizza making kits, sausage roll making kits, or, pie, or chicken pie making kits. Um, so another major concern that we're having is the issues of families not being able to go shopping out for themselves due to be due to pre-existing medical conditions or self-isolation so this is obviously a very serious problem as people rely on access to shops to feed their families to provide basic necessities like toilet paper toothpaste and soap for washing their hands so at this time we really do rely on people helping each other out and looking after their neighbors and thankfully we have seen this happen in the community with a lot of our volunteers from oasis helping our elderly neighbors out by doing shopping for them which has been fantastic to see and I would definitely encourage anyone who can to do, do that to definitely get out and do it. Another way we're trying to do our part within Oasis is through the launch of our new project, which is being funded by Cash for Kids. So this project is being done over four weeks and, we, and we, will, we will be providing breakfasts and dinners to 37 targeted young people who are eligible for free school meals. They'll have 20 different breakfast options and eight different dinner options over the course of this project. And they will also be shown how to cook on a budget with the hope obviously being then that they can continue to do this after the project comes to an end. We're also requesting a number of young people to keep food diaries to show progress over these four weeks. So this will detail what they're eating, how often they're eating, and who is cooking. So this will give us a really valuable insight into the lives of young people during lockdown. Uh, this is also a great way to get the young people involved in a fun way to encourage them to cook and to show, like, to show it off in their food diary. These diaries can only can be kept as in-depth as young people want to go. So it's all within their comfort zone. They have control over the format these take as well. So they could do uh, video diaries, little voice notes for us, or just simply just a written diary, whatever they're most comfortable doing. And uh, hopefully this freedom to choose will be a big draw to get them to actually take the time out of their day to do it because they're choosing which method they want to do it by. Food poverty, of course, is not a new issue. It's been an issue for as long as anyone can remember. However, it is important to note the effects have worsened over the lockdown period and it is affecting more and more people due to the conditions I've already mentioned. The negative effects this can have on a young person are endless. Physically, they will have issues with weight loss, they'll counter a lack of energy and by extension can't concentrate on their schoolwork uh, or on any work from home they have to do. Like it was mentioned earlier, they will fall behind. But... There are also serious mental implications for those facing food poverty. 
a low mood will definitely manifest itself. And in a time of lockdown and isolation, many people do not have the proper access to the support network they would normally have, which just worsens the situation for them. So the question is, how do we help these people? Tackling food poverty is clearly the way forward with a specific issue. Through this, we can at least limit the problem of the negative mental health and the negative physical health that comes with it. This is a long-term goal, but it is absolutely something we can achieve. And as a, son, as a collective society, we can and should be working towards. Alongside this, we can be there for each other, reach out online, check in on one another, and show that we care for those who are being affected by this issue. This is a time of uncertainty for all of us, and I know it can be hard to always remember to think of those, uh, think of others, because we have our own problems and our own worries, but it's so important right now to remember those who are struggling, and for all of us to think of ways to help each other in our communities. I strongly urge anyone who can help to do so, and if anyone has any other ideas of how youth groups or other organisations can help, please get in touch and share these ideas. We can and we will get through this together. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Shane. That was really useful. It really gives you very, very practical examples, and I suppose tying into what Sinead's work in terms of her research to actually have that anecdotal real life evidence that you're providing and the work that you're doing through Oasis, particularly not only for young people, but for older people and getting young people involved in the whole issue of food and the need for food and food poverty is critically important. I think the work that you're doing will really contribute a lot to policy development. I'm sure the MLAs are cl- listening very closely to that there and want to actually get some of the information because young people like yourself who can provide real practical examples of how we can start to address this major social issue. So I want to move on to the next speaker then is Ryan Fitzsimmons from Advice NI who's going to talk about the food issues facing families currently in the breakdown. Over to you Ryan. Thank you um, Liam. Good morning conference. For those of you who perhaps don't know, Advice NI exists to provide leadership and services to our members. We're predominantly in the business of supporting the independent advice sector. But rather uniquely for us, on the 27th of March, we began to operate the COVID-19 Community Helpline. Next slide, please, Roger. We have seen unprecedented demand for that service. We've taken about 18,000 calls since the 27th of March um, from 14,000 odd clients with some repeat calls. Of that, we've seen almost 18,000 issues and 69% of all of those issues were food related. For us, that is unprecedented. As an organization and a network that's ordinarily in the business of giving advice in relation to social security, to housing and what have you, food issues obviously come up, but not with such prevalence. Ordinarily, when we give advice in relation to food issues, it's as a result of sanctions, as a result of waiting times for universal credit, but we found by default for most of our client interactions through this period, and we still are finding this, that 69% of all issues were entirely food related. Next slide, please, Roger. Now, what were those issues? Um, Shane had mentioned some earlier. We have a situation where people's income has been vastly or partially reduced. We have social security cuts to a system that arguably wasn't sufficient before it was cut. Set that against the fact that food costs have been rising consistently over the years. And certainly many callers to our line anecdotally were telling us during the lockdown period, costs were rising even more so. Set that against the lack of transport where people couldn't get to the larger supermarkets to buy better value items. Or set that against issues with the availability of online delivery or even delivery fees. And what we have seen is this perfect storm. Next slide, please, Robert. But frankly, we say that these issues were not created in a COVID-19 vacuum. They've been there. They've been there for many, many years. And there are many, many complex reasons for it. But let's think of welfare reform, the two-child cap, 
Let's think of the four-year freeze on benefit upgrading. Let's think of design issues with universal credit and its, and its five-week uh, five wait um, for first payment. And when those payments are received, many families are surprised by how small they are compared to what their bills are. Um, I noted with interest Sinead's discussion earlier about an individual needing £57 a week um, to observe a decent baseline healthy diet. Let's think about basic unemployment benefits or standard allowances for benefits being around the £70 mark for the over 25, 53, 54 for the under 25s. And the mathematics simply don't work. The food poverty that existed prior to COVID-19 will continue to exist unless we look more long-term. But in terms of the short-term issues, indeed, we had many parents tell us that they were grateful for school meal monies to run on, but that money was going into the overall household budget instead of going directly into the mouths of children because we're in a situation where incomes are greatly reduced, salaries are reduced, self-employed people's income is decimated, and there's uncertainty, but we will argue that that's been on the horizon for long. Next slide, please. So what do we actually do? Advice and I support the call to address the short-term issue of holiday hunger, um, deal with this over, over the summer, continue and extend those payments, but we also support the introduction of longer-term legislation to ensure that no child goes hungry ever again. We call for the mitigation measures to be wholly legislated for long term and to be expanded and problems with them fixed like the issues with bedroom tax payments. And in particular, the two child limit on families, which in Northern Ireland disproportionately affects our families. We would like to see that entirely mitigated. These are all issues that are contributing to child hunger. They were there before this pandemic and unfortunately, unless we fix this, they may well be there for a very long time after it. So we think the conversation needs to move in that momentum and we would certainly support the aims of the, the conference. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ryan. That's great. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, Chris Little, then the uh, MLA, who's the chair of the All Party Group on Children and Young People, to provide some closing remarks. And then I think we've got the speakers have been fantastic at keeping to the time. I've never seen such a more orderly group of speakers. Maybe the digital platform works best. So I hope what we're going to try and do is pull some of the questions out of the chat and maybe try and get them addressed as we close up to 11.30. So maybe if I pass over to yourself, uh, Chris, to pick up on some of the themes that's coming through from the speakers here and talk about the issues as you see as part of your closing remarks. Thanks, Liam. Uh, and thanks to the World Party Group on Children and Young People, Secretariat, Children in Northern Ireland, for uh, making this event happen today. It, it's been invaluable um, from all our speakers' contributions. Um, really grateful to uh, Deputy Chairperson Catherine Kelly for our opening our comments and setting out the executive action that has been taken, particularly in response to COVID around the extension of free school meals. I think that investment is at approximately £10 million as it stands. Catherine also referenced the Eat Well, Live Well uh, and, and the local responses. And I'd be re remiss of me not to shout out East Belfast Community Development Agency's local response uh, to uh, food hunger during this time as well. Um, right for Catherine also to say, however, that we need to see Department of Education and Department for Communities working together to ensure that this action extends uh, beyond June. Um, and obviously the, the Westminster inquiry to which the All Party Group responded highlighted a number of innovative local responses to hunger across Northern Ireland. I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Sinead Fury um, outlining the excellent work that Ulster University is doing to evidence the extent of food insecurity. Um, which has found that hidden hunger is a public health emergency and also to identify the key root causes to which we need to respond in terms of low income, unemployment and, and food prices. Les, as always, uh, raised our awareness uh, of the international law obligations that we have in relation uh, to this issue. 
highlighted the need for that anti-poverty poverty strategy uh, and for us to focus on mitigations and solutions. Great to hear from Shane and uh, Shane Robinson and the outstanding work that he's doing as a, a young food ambassador. Um, really interesting points around the importance of tracking how the free school meal payment is being used um, <clears throat> and, and highlighting the, the excellent work uh, that he and uh, his colleagues are doing to get di uh, food directly to families. Um, thanks to Ryan as well from Advice and I. Um, I um, have have not been our party's communities or, or social security spokesperson ever, but when the, the welfare uh, reform was passing through the assembly, I made sure that I, I spoke up on behalf of our independent advice sector every opportunity that I have. Um, I know the work of Advice NI is outstanding and East Belfast Independent Advice Centre um, brings millions of pounds worth of entitled uh, assistance into uh, my local community. So extremely grateful for the, the policy and practical work that Advice and I are doing <coughs> on this issue. Um, from my point of view and in, in, in my closing comments, Liam, um, I, I think it's key that Northern Ireland has to aim to be a world leader in responding to food poverty in the right space and cross-cutting way necessary to deliver on the right to food. The anti-poverty strategy was a high priority of the new decade, uh, new approach agreement, and we have to make sure that that is delivered on. I, I see in the questions that reference being made to the ad hoc committee on the Bill of Rights being a vehicle to include a right to food um, in Northern Ireland. And, and I think we need to use the programme for government to ensure accountability on all these issues, um, work to set stronger and more specific targets in relation to delivery on the right to food and i propose that it is in the new decade new approach agreement that we establish an ad hoc committee on the program for government in order that we can hold the executive to account in a cross-cutting way um, i'm chair of the education committee so we, we might have a particular focus on free school leads for example but there's no reason why we couldn't form an ad hoc committee on the programme for government, potentially made up of the chairs of uh, the committees, so that we can hone in on particular targets um, from all our different committee perspectives uh, and make sure that the executive is delivering in that, that cross-cutting way that we need. But I look forward to working with everyone to, to make sure that we do, do deliver on this issue. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, I'm going to try and pick up on a couple of, of questions uh, that's come forward. One of the questions come through was the whole idea of the food diary and the voice notes. I know there's some people that come back and respond to that, but maybe Shane, maybe you would maybe expand on that slightly if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so... Um... I'm not really sure what else to say except that like it's going to be done obviously for the young people who are in the four week project that we were talking about. So at the start, we would expect to see maybe, um, we would expect to see improvement over the course of the project basically with what they're reading. And um, then this obviously improves our ability to track that as well and just see what the young people in our projects are eating at the start and then see how we can help over the course of few, over four weeks. Um. And again, like just, uh, it's good as well just to get them involved in a project to improve their mental health, to have like the sense of community where like they'll be like sending off to someone who does care about what they're saying to us. It's just kind of the idea behind it, to be honest. Thanks, Shane. The, the other question that come through is food for life framework and the potential impact on education loss. Is there anything you want to pick up on that, Sinead? Is that any part of the research that you're doing? I wouldn't have anything specific to say about it except to to support to support the, the, the idea of it. I'm afraid it's not really my my area. Um, I, I I totally agree um, with the importance of home economics and the importance of that um, learning for life and work in terms of life skills. And I would never underplay it. Um, so I would simply advocate um, to SIA and other uh, relevant parties the importance and, um, of always always retaining. Um, Home economics on the Northern Ireland curriculum. I'm going to pull in Pauline Leeson from Children in Northern Ireland here. Uh, have you got any views on that, Pauline, or is there anything that is uh, been information been brought to you? Liam, thank you so much. I was just typing a, um, a, a reply in there to you. Um, it, it is something that we've been very concerned about for a long time. 
And um, we've worked with University of Northumbria, who've actually tracked a lot of um, uh, this this material uh, down through the years. Um, the, the huge issue is, of course, when when children, young people don't get access to nutritious food, then that has an effect on on their health. But also, what Northumbria found was that when children, young people don't get free school meals um, during the holidays, there is uh, an impact on on their learning. And the impact on the learning carries um, is incremental. It carries from year to year. So what you're seeing are both health and education and inequalities widening as we go forward. And I note that um, Kerry has said that this, you know, the food poverty has been an issue for decades. I, I would totally agree with that and, and Les and Sinead's analysis. Um, I think that um, we would be pushing um, in the first place uh, free school meals to be extended during the holidays to address issues around um, um, food and but also education. We've just finished an evaluation of our own four holiday hunger projects in Northern Ireland and um, hopefully after this seminar today we want to look at launching that in September and helping the education committee in particular to address some of those further widening inequalities and um, it really is a very concerning time we'd also like picking up on some of the uh, comments we'd also like to explore the um, potential to enshrine the right to food further in, in legislative reform and um, because it's a problem that's absolutely definitely not going away anything that i've seen on post-covid recovery um, is looking at you know a, a major recession and you're quite right uh, in saying that the families at the bottom of the pile are even further away from those at the top so we will be following following both these issues up after the holidays Liam thank you Thanks, Pauline. Uh, maybe pick up then just in terms of the wider uh, food poverty issues. Maybe, Les, is there anything else you want to contribute, haven't heard from uh, Shane and from Ryan on, on, on them issues? Yeah, there's two things. Um, one thing about my um, uh, age, and as you can see from my grey hair, is I do have an institutional memory around Social Security. Up until the mid-1980s, for example, the Social Security system used to set out what your benefits should actually purchase and what it should cover and we dropped that in the 1980s and they dropped it uh, it was then the conservative government because they knew that um, the money in benefit could not meet all the things that other people would take take for granted so this is about income in essence um, the second thing i'd say is we should look to Scotland as one example. Scotland, for example, is taking a more rights-based approach to social security. It's also done a number of very innovative things. Scotland has less control of uh, social security than we actually do here. But just to take one example, um, over the last 10 years, we've got rid of additional money in tax credits for uh, newborn children in the first 12 months of, of life. We had a health in pregnancy grant that we the government got rid of. Sure start maternity payments were um, a kind of one child, one payment policy was introduced. We've made a number of cuts to Social Security for the newborn. And you remember the Social Security system was meant to be from cradle to grave. Uh, Scotland has done a number of things to, um, to tackle that. Northern Ireland could do that. Um, there it's costed it's another of the ways in which we can do things which are progressive the two child policy the institute for fiscal studies has set out that the projected increase in child poverty in the next three years almost all of it is down to uh, the introduction of the two child policy so larger families in particular are very adversely affected by what we do on social security so there are levers that we have in northern ireland that we can utilize my final point and it was about i think there was a, a question on the bill of rights two things to say about that the ad hoc committee on the bill of rights is a really important initiative uh, the bill of rights is an unfinished part of the belfast good friday agreement but i would say that under the agreement we're talking about um, issues that take into account the particular circumstances of northern ireland the reality, I think, is that food poverty is not 
confined, frankly, to Northern Ireland. It's an issue across these islands. Therefore, um, while the Commission is very strongly supportive of seeing a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, I much more quickly uh, than we'll get a Bill of Rights, which is still ultimately in the um, hands of the Westminster government and to an extent the Irish government. So these are things that we can do some practical things, the extension of the mitigations package um, and a kind of review and revision that is socially progressive is probably the number one target and that can include many of the food poverty issues that were mentioned earlier. Thanks Liz. We bring Ellen Finley in from Children in Northern Ireland who's, who's doing a lot of work on this. Ellen, if you have some comment you wish to make. Liam, I actually have some questions from some of the other people that um, okay. we've been chatting about. Um, Sinead, there's a, a few questions for you. Um, will further research be carried out looking at the current COVID-19 crisis and food poverty? And in terms of when you were talking about food banks, do you include the likes of the Salvation Army and St. Vincent de Paul and churches, etc., who also um, deliver food parcels? Thank you. Uh, I'll take the second question first, Ellen. It's a, it's a quicker answer. Um, they, um, I've only cited 38 food banks and they are Trussell Trust. Um, so I have... I have, um, and I apologise for it, but the data are so hard to come by in terms of independent uh, faith-based um, you know, independent food banks. So no, the, the 38 refers specifically to um, Trussell Trust food bank centres in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I, I'm aware that's, um, that's um, a, a huge deficit not to have it, um, the full data, but I know the Independent Food Aid Network um, it, um, is looking to all four regions to come up with comprehensive data as to the number of um, food banks um, independent food banks throughout. Um, the first the first question then um, around further research. I've talked so long on the second one I've forgotten the point of the first. Apologies. Would Will you? further research be carried out looking at the current crisis and food poverty? Thank you. Apologies, I slipped there. Um, so yes, and I, I think it was um, Pauline in the notes. We are um, with yourselves in Children in Northern Ireland. We are, um, and we have approached the Department for Communities to understand if there is potential funding available to support um, you know, a COVID-19 specific um, research and data gathering for um, f um, food insecurity in Northern Ireland. Uh, we don't have an answer on that yet because we're still at the clarification stage um, um, so our um, department for communities did come back to us um, and looking for additional insight um, in terms of you know and the parameters of any such research um, so there's nothing to report there yet but we do continue to try to push because um, as as speakers have said throughout and your common theme throughout has been this is likely to only get worse um, and it would be really important to have northern ireland data at this point in time but nothing to report yet Okay, thank you. Um, another question is for Ryan. Um, Ryan, do you, you were talking about the delivery of the food parcels. Do you know how healthy the food parcels are and the nutritional um, value of it? Has that been considered in terms of delivering them? I don't, but I can certainly try and get that information. Okay, that's great. That was just someone who had asked that. Um, and also, Ryan, sorry, our specific diets and needs in terms of cultural um, specific needs, um, are they addressed in the food parcels as well? To my understanding, the question for that, the answer to that is no. That's something that okay. we But as for the exact contents of them, I can. There, I think there's some local variants in that, but I, I can see what that I can, I can receive for that at certain points. Okay. Okay, um, and I'm not sure who this question would be for, but um, there's a concern over the increase of those who are now eligible for free school meals. So how quickly do you think they'll receive payment? And are these children actually currently missing out at the moment? I, I could offer to follow that up. Um, yeah. I don't know the answer to that straight away, but obviously that's okay. something that we can address via the education committee. Um, I, I know that obviously there has been additional eligibility um, and the, the payment mechanism was originally via the data that the education authority held in relation to the uniform allowance mm -hmm. payments um, which needed supplemented via checks so um, we're certainly trying to keep an eye on that uh, payment reaching everyone that is eligible to, eligible to receive it so we, we, we'd be glad to follow that up. Okay that's brilliant and then there has been questions about um, the slides and other research so we will be sending it out at the end of this webinar. 
So that was all the questions, Liam. Thanks very much. Uh, unless anyone has any other pressing issues to raise, I'm going to bring the webinar to a, a close. I've never seen meetings run so tightly to time. Uh, Chris, and maybe it's your involvement and Catherine's involvement in the day sort of keep it very much rigid, but it's been great. So all it's got to do for me is really to thank, first of all, our speakers, Catherine, uh, Sinead, uh, Les, Shane and Ryan uh, and finally Chris uh, to thank Ellen and, and particularly for organising and making this work. Uh, Richard also for the technology in terms of making it or Roger work for the technology for making it work for us so well and, and keeping us all on, on board. Somebody who's a technophobe totally, I, I sort of managed my way through this and again for Pauline and children in Northern Ireland who, who are critically important and been leading the drive in regard to child poverty for many years. Years. We know this is really not the start, and it's not even the, near the end, but it's something that we believe is critically important that we need to raise up the agenda. It's something I had done in my working career in local government, I've been working with Pauline on both in Kilkeel and Dan Patrick in terms of looking at child poverty and realising the good work that can be done by interventions during, uh, during the summertime. So I think it's something we want to move on. So listen, Thanks to everybody. Uh, uh, just to repeat that we will be sending out a link to the webinar. Thank you all for participating. There's no point in having webinars if people don't log in. And we'd, I think over 30 people had seen at one point in time logging into the webinar. Uh, and also to, to watch out for further information on this as we go forward. As I say, and, and all good webinars and Zoom meetings, I hope you all have a very good day. Thanks very much. Thank you.